Good evening. Welcome back. This is the final session from uh, Revelation Unmasked. And I believe this will bring together all the loose ends that uh, we left here and there along the way. The seventh section of the book of Revelation, the final section. So we are ready to see the final picture, the culmination of everything happening in the book. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this journey. Seven segments, seven weeks. And at each segment, we discovered new things, surprising, sometimes shocking things. Lord, we are looking now with hope to this final section because we already know who's the winner. So, Lord, we pray that you will enlighten our hearts and minds through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Before going to the text, I would like to do a quick summary or revision of the final events that we have seen together up to this point. Okay? Ready? These three lines here are the three angels... These three somethings here are the three frogs. 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 The hopping things. You know why I put them side by side? Because while the everlasting gospel is being preached by the three angels in the middle of heaven, in the midst of heaven, the enemy, or the false trio, the false trinitarian, uh, diabolic powers, which is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, they also do a three frogs message, which is a false message that tries to counteract the effect of the three angels' message. So, while the gospel is being preached, the devil has his gospel as well. Before the time of mercy or grace is over, and this is the altar that I canceled out, the altar of incense, there is a sealing process and the marking process going side by side. God is sealing his. The enemy is marking his. Somewhere here, there is a death decree. Here or here. We have not established that with precision. And here as well, there is an economic component to it. Those that do not worship the beast or do not take the mark of the beast, they cannot sell, they cannot buy. Revelation chapter 13. When this happens, when the sanctuary service in heaven ceases, the seven plagues start being poured out. So these are the seven bowls or the seven plagues. In the sixth plague, we have the fall of Babylon, followed by the battle of Armageddon. But the battle of Armageddon is actually happening when the king of kings and lord of lords appears, followed by his uh, 
riders, and there is the final clash between gods and the enemies. At this point here, when Jesus comes, there is a first resurrection. Then a thousand years pass, and there is a second resurrection. Where are the righteous in between during the thousand years? The righteous are in heaven, and the wicked, they are out. They are waiting for what? For the second resurrection. When the second resurrection happens, Satan that is bound here, Satan, comes back, he's loose again. Why? Because now he has again people to work with. Then there is here a certain time, we don't know exactly how long it takes for them to organize for a final attack against the city of New Jerusalem. But how can they attack the city of New Jerusalem if the city is in heaven? Well, we'll see tonight, the city actually comes down, right? And that's when they try to surround the city. They want to attack the city. Ironically, the gates of the city, we will see tonight, never close. So, in theory, if they want to enter the city, they could. But they don't want to enter the city. They want to destroy the city. So... That's when fire comes down from heaven. This is fire coming fr down from heaven. And the new creation happens. New earth plus new heaven. Now, you may be looking for some other details on this graphic that may not appear, but I believe these are the main elements of the final events, the main structural background of the final events in the book of Revelation from chapter 12 onward. So from this section onward, because these three sections, first, second, and third, they describe the history of Christianity. And I will one more time lay out these seven sections. The seven churches. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, right? So the seven churches that are paralleled by the seven seals and by the seven trumpets, all three of those sevens are actually the seven segments of the history of Christianity from different angles. Then we have the middle piece, the great controversy piece. And this section here, from 5, 6, 7 or end time events, those events that I kind of try to outline here. Okay. Now please follow the movement of John through the book of uh, Revelation. This is what is happening. In this first section here, the section of the seven churches, John starts his visions on the earth. He is on the earth, on Patmos, 
And in vision, he sees Jesus in the sanctuary walking among the candlesticks. So what section of the sanctuary is that? The holy place, the first section. So here he is still on earth. Starting with the next section, section 2, he is in heaven in vision. Because in chapter 4, at the beginning of the chapter, somebody tells him, come up here. And he goes up there. Then in chapter 3, he still sees things in vision from a heavenly perspective, so to speak. Here, we have a sanctuary scene as well, because the sanctuary is open and we see the throne. Where is the throne? In the most holy. Why do we have an insight into the most holy? Because here we have the inauguration of Jesus' heavenly high priestly ministry. After the cross, after obtaining victory on earth, here, he goes back to heaven and his high priestly ministry is inaugurated. Then we have uh, the seven trumpets. There the sanctuary is again in view because we have the two altars, the one in the courtyard and also the one in the first section, the holy place. So both the altar of sacrifices and the altar of incense. Right here in the middle, chapters 12 through 14, in the introduction vision, we have another sanctuary element. Do you remember what it was? The Ark of the Covenant. Where is the Ark of the Covenant? Most holy place. All right. Then here in the fifth, which is uh, the seven plagues, right at the beginning in the introduction of that section, we have another sanctuary element. We have one of the altars. Which altar? The sacrifice altar or the incense altar? The incense altar, because that's when the sanctuary service ceases. In this section, we practically don't have a sanctuary element. We have some heavenly beings praising God for judging Babylon and for his justice, for his righteousness, but there is no sanctuary element. Guess why? Because there is no sanctuary service happening here. And then we reach the seventh section, and this is where John comes back to earth. So he starts his vision from an earthly perspective, like looking upwards, and he goes up, this is the circuit, and then he comes back and he reaches earth again here. Now that is interesting because in the text we will find some elements that confirm the importance of him coming back to earth. Please follow. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So we are here. Here. Okay. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. And this is an important observation. Do you know why? Because when he started his vision, he was surrounded by what? By the sea. So in his vision, he reaches the point where there is no more sea. So he comes back to a, an earthly picture, but he doesn't see the sea. So the earth looks totally different now. 
It is like, imagine this area here after some cataclysmic tragedies that can happen. Say an earthquake destroys everything and fire, but you miraculously are evacuated. And when you are being evacuated, you look back and see the desolate place for the last time. And you kind of stick with that picture in mind. Then you are brought back later. And when you come back, you not only not see the destruction that had happened, but everything is much more beautiful, much more splendid than it used to be before. So that's the picture. And John is happy that there is no more sea because for him the sea was the problem. Because he was on an island, he wanted to go to see his brothers, his churches, he couldn't. The sea was the first impediment. So he is happy. Now, all this is still in vision. Just imagine John, after he comes out of his vision, and he realizes the sea is still there. Right? Because he here is still in vision. And then when the vision is over, he switches back, or God switches him back to earthly reality. And he realizes, well, the sea is still there. But in his vision, he doesn't see the sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So he sees the heavenly city coming down, adorned as a bride, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now you may ask, okay, so is the New Jerusalem a br the bride? Or are the saved the bride? Please notice the text doesn't say that the city is the bride. The city is prepared as a bride. But at this moment when the city comes down, where is the bride? The bride is inside the city. So there is a reason why the city is pictured as a bride adorned for her husband. Because the bride, the bride of the Lamb, meaning the saved, the righteous, are in the city coming back. Because you remember, I emphasize that, we hear people saying, all I want is to get to heaven. And I said that is a limited theology. Because our final destination is not heaven, our final destination is back here, new earth. Okay? So, John goes on saying, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. What Old Testament festival does that bring in mind? The festival of tabernacles. And now we can see how those things go together because here in the first section we had Pesach or Passover. In the second section... We had Shavuot or, no, Shavuot, Pentecost, okay? Or the Festival of the Weeks, it's called. Then, Yom Teruah, what is that? That was the Festival of the Trumpets in the third section. Then you have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, right here in the central piece. What is interesting is, is that from here downwards, in the final events, you keep having Yom Kippur, 
you have Yom Kippur here as well, but then there is one festival missing. And there is only one festival after Yom Kippur. Which one? It's the tabernacle. So where should the tabernacle come? Right here. You have Sukkot. So please notice how the book of Revelation is a masterpiece. It's not just somebody sitting down writing out something. No, no, no. It has a structure that is beautifully playing out all those Old Testament background stories of the sanctuary service, of the festivals, and everything is brought together here in the celebration of Sukkot when God tabernacles with His people. Remember what John says about Jesus Christ? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But interestingly, in the Greek, the Word is tabernacled among us. In other words, Jesus' first coming was a foretaste of what will happen after the reestablishment of all things when God will finally and for eternity tabernacle with his people. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That speaks about God's character. What kind of God is the one that wipes away every tear? Please keep that in mind because that will bring something important to mind later on in the story. So God wipes away every tear from their eyes. All those pain-born tears are wiped away. There shall be no more death. Is there anything more complicated and more difficult to handle in human existence than death? You know, I had a moment in my life when I was an atheist. And uh, I did a lot of research to see what is different in Christianity compared to all the philosophical and uh, religious discourse out there. And one of the great realizations I had was that no philosophy and no religion outside of Christianity or the religion of the Bible, more precisely, because Christianity as it is now, by and large, does not align or align to the Bible in many ways, not even in the problem of death. Because Christianity has redefined the concept of death and it gives us the impression that death does not exist because you survive your own death. When you die, your spirit or soul, or depending on the language, goes somewhere, so you practically don't die. The book of Revelation deals with the problem of death. And there is a moment where death shall be no more. So that's the solution that God has. It's not something you have to get used to it. It's something that God will take out radically and forever. There shall be no more pain. I think uh, everybody can somehow relate to that. For the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. What is happening here, I imagine like this. John is writing, 
And when he sees, because all of this he sees in vision, when he sees all this beauty, all this splendor of the new creation, he drops the pan. But he said to me, he says, right. Because in 2022, with a group of people from the Laguna Niguel SDA Church, Pastor Joe will have some revelation seminars. And if you don't try it now, then how are they going to know? So God has to tell him specifically, hey, hey, don't, don't stop here. Just a little more. Right to the end. Because these things are true and faithful. These words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give up the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. What moment in the history of humanity brings to mind this fountain of the water of life? What? Garden of Eden? Absolutely. Because we have a movement from the Garden of Eden back to the Garden of Eden. But later on you will see that even now the water of life is available. The text will come back to it later. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Question for you. There is a section in the book of Revelation in which this expression, he who overcomes, appears a number of times. Does anybody know how many times? Seven times. What is the section? The churches. See? How, again, the parallel structure becomes obvious. Okay? But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So again, the Bible does not teach that everybody will live eternally on the new earth. There are some that will not make it there, and they have their part in the lake. We've seen that before last time, lake of fire, which is second death. I'm emphasizing it again. The Bible teaches that the lake of fire is second death. So this pop culture Christianity idea of the everlasting torture in hellfire is not a biblical teaching. Because if it's second death, it cannot be life eternally in hell. Then, and we have now another movie. Okay? This movie zooms in on the city itself. So what we had practically up to this point is a description, a short description of what life will be like from this point on. New earth plus new heaven. And then we have a zoom in on this here, on the city. Then, says the text, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Where is the lamb's wife at this point? In the city. Okay. So that's the focus. It's a zoom in on the bride. But do you remember that probably the same angel, 
because it was one of the seven angels that had the bows or the plagues, spoke to John prior and told him something similar. Come, let me show you what? What did he show him? The harlot. So probably the same angel sh shows John first the harlot or Babylon, and now the bride of the Lamb or New Jerusalem, because you have this contrast, New Jerusalem and Babylon. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So he has something that you can call in today's language Google Sky. Have you heard about Google Sky? There's Google Earth. When you go with a cursor, with an arrow, and visit places, you can do tourism from home with Google Earth. But now they have Google Sky. Okay, so that's, that's similar to what is happening here to John. He sees the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven. First, he has a picture from afar, and then he goes closer and closer, or rather, the city comes closer to him. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. That's the beauty, the splendor of the city as it comes closer and closer to John. Also, she had a great and high wall, so now he sees the walls, with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So these are the 12 Old Testament tribes, the sons of Jacob or Israel. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you have the 12 sons of Israel in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles from the New Testament. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. So... The basic layout of the city is a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. So tell me what is the shape then? It's a cube. Because length, breadth, and height is the same. Do you know anything in the Bible that had that same shape? What is it? A most holy place, correct. A most holy place was a cube. So it seems that the city of Jerusalem stands for what the most holy place stood in the earthly sanctuary. It's the heavenly correspondent of that. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. I have a hard time understanding what this really is about. But the 144, I think, 144 reminds us of the 144,000. Because in the Bible, quite often the measuring of something has to do with checking whether that place is good enough for those. So this is, that's how I take it, like a confirmation that the city is the right place for the 144,000. Then the construction of its wall was of jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones, 12 different kinds of stones that remind of the breastplate 
best plate of the high priest. I didn't write them there because I would break my tongue. It's pretty difficult to pronounce them. But this whole description of the city brings something as a question in mind. Is this description of the city of New Jerusalem telling us what kind of, kind of building materials they use in heaven? What kind of minerals, what kind of metals and stones there are in heaven? Is that what this is about? Or it's rather a description from which you can get the sense that, wow, everything there is superior, much better, way better than anything we can see here. Let me give you an example. Suppose you have a little child or a grandchild that has never seen a giraffe. You've seen a giraffe, right? So how are you going to explain to your little grandchild what a giraffe is because he or she has never seen a giraffe? What? Well, maybe he or she has seen before a horse or a donkey. So you can start there. And then you can say, okay, a giraffe is somewhat like a horse, but it has much longer legs and a much longer neck. Let me ask you now, does your child or grandchild now understand what a giraffe is? Uh, somewhat. That's exactly what we get from here. Do we know now what New Jerusalem looks like? Uh, somewhat. <laughs> Just to get an idea, you know? Just to, to, to get a taste of it, maybe. But I'm sure the splendor of it, to be there, to be in it, to see it for real, is much greater, much bigger. Because language... And remember the Apostle Paul, he had uh, some sort of experience out of the body or in the body. He says, I don't even know. Fact is, what I've seen is beyond, beyond comprehension. Language is too small, too insignificant. The meaning of the words is not sufficient, not enough to express the splendor. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. How can that be? A gate, a pearl, a pearl as big as a gate. 12 pearls, each individual gate was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. This is important because the city of Jerusalem, the earthly city of Jerusalem, without a temple is an incomplete city. Yerushalayim, which is the city of peace. Yerushalayim, without, without a temple, is a weird place. That's why even today there is this Zionist movement, I believe you heard about them, that have plans, drawings, and logistics in place, and waiting for the moment when they can rebuild what? The temple, where? In Jerusalem, because Jerusalem without a temple is a desolate place. So in that context, this is very significant because it says that I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Meaning that God's presence is there. God is tabernacling with them. Remember there was a story in the Gospels where Jesus said, I will destroy this 
and in three days I'll build it back. And they thought he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem when in fact he was talking about himself, about his death and resurrection. So he is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb or its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Please notice the text doesn't say there will be no sun or moon. It says that there will be no need of them. Because when you have that huge light of a stadium, can you imagine the light of a stadium? If you lit a candle, if you light a candle under that huge lamp, is this needed? No. I'm just emphasizing this because some people will say, well, this is against science to have no sun and no moon. And I believe the text doesn't say there will be no sun and no moon. I believe the recreation of the new earth and new heavens refers to the recreation of um, this earth and the surrounding atmosphere that we call heaven too. I'm not sure it has to do with any other planets, really. And the nations of those who are saved, keep this in mind, the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. Its light, says my translation. I think it's correct to say in his, meaning the Lamb's light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. Remember I said it earlier that the gates are open. So in theory they could get in. But they have no interest to get in. All their interest is to destroy. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations. Again the nations, that's important, into it. But there shall be no, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And this is a light motive. It comes back again and again. The Lamb's book of life. So all those that are in the Lamb's book of life have access in the city, into the city. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Again, the river of water of life. What place? Eden. Clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street. So now we have a street view. So first John saw the city from afar. The city comes closer. It becomes bigger. And at one point, John gets into the city. So now he's inside the city, and he has a street view of the city. It's like Google Earth with a street view. Okay? In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life. Tree of life? Where else did you find the tree of life? Garden of Eden which bore 12 fruits, 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. So every month, a different fruit? Ah, I think there's something in Isaiah 66 that speaks about going every new moon or every month to worship God in a special way. So this might tie into that. But I want to emphasize this final statement here. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. We had the nations of those that are saved or in the city. But this is a, a weird language here. How are they going to be healed? 
Are you going sick there? So how are you going to be healed when 1 Corinthians 15 says that when Jesus comes, we are transformed like this, and our corruptible and uh, perishable body will be transformed into a spiritual body, and those that are resurrected, they come out with that transformation already being in place. So how are you going to be healed? Well, here is, here is the thing. The Bible speaks about our body being fixed before going to heaven, to the city of New Jerusalem. Yes, but the Bible never speaks about our psyche being fixed before going to heaven. And the word here in the Greek language is therapeia. Do you have uh, an English word for that? What is that? Therapy. So it's not healing in the sense that you will get some injections, some shots, some, I don't know, what kind of treatment. It is therapy. And that explains a lot. Because it's a healing of the nations. Just imagine how much pain has been accumulated in the DNA of the nations. Look, for instance, at Russia and Ukraine. Everybody says it's a fratricidal war, meaning brothers killing one another. Remember that the gospel is for all nations. Every nation is to hear the gospel. So one day in New Jerusalem, you will have a Russian and a Ukrainian side by side. Maybe some things will come back to mind. Maybe they will need Jesus to take them, sit them down under the tree of life and have some therapy together. They need some therapy because in the Bible, the tree and sitting under the tree is a place or the canopy of the tree is a place of therapy. Let me give you some language, Old Testament language. Everybody will sit under their fig tree and under their vine. Have you heard that language? It speaks about a time of shalom, like in the time of Shlomo. Who's Shlomo? Solomon. Solomon, the name Solomon comes from shalom. Shalom, Shlomo. And the time, the high time of the time of Shlomo is a time when everybody is able to sit under his fig tree and under his vine. That's the best time. But then when the Jews were taken into Babylon, into captivity, there were some prophetic messages given to the people that God will bring them back from Babylon where? From Babylon to Jerusalem or Canaan. And again, they will be able to sit under their trees. And healing will happen. God will do therapy to them. And don't miss the fact that the sanctuary festival or the Old Testament festival in view here is which festival? Tabernacle, Sukkot, or boots. Tabernacle. What did they make the tabernacles out of? Branches with leaves. The leaves of the tree. It's leaves. 
Why? Because what was the tabernacles about? The festival of tabernacles. It was about the time when God was protecting them during their time in the wilderness. And after they got into their land, into Canaan, God wanted to remind them of those days and reassure them, hey, if I was with you there, I will be with you here. So we have all that Old Testament background for the leaves, for the tree, for healing happening under the tree. Are we going to eat the leaves? You know, there are leaves that are used even today for cure. So that would not be a surprise either. But just imagine that when you get into the New Jerusalem, you will see the records of your life. And all those questions that have never been answered in your life up to this point and will never be answered until Jesus comes back. The Bible doesn't teach that when Jesus comes back, he will sit down with you and uh, give you some explanations, some clarifications, and then take you to heaven. No. He doesn't even touch the earth, it seems. So you go home, but you may still have questions. And now the records are open to you, and you can see all those difficult moments when you said, why? Why, God? Why me, Lord? Why is this happening to me? Why aren't you just the way you say you are? And God can explain to you and do to you what? Therapy. Or one day you are walking around in the city of New Jerusalem and accidentally stumble upon somebody you can't believe is there. <laughs> Think about a wife that sees her abusive ex or a husband that sees his abusive ex. Or think about a child that sees his or her molester or a slave that sees his or her slave master. And I'm not speaking about these people being there in their sinful way of life. No, no. But all these people had a chance to repent. And some of those people have repented. And it will be a very surprising experience for you to see something that you could not imagine will ever make it there. And you may go to Jesus one day and say, Lord, that's a mistake. You should embrace your mistake. And he will come to you and embrace you. And he will tell you, you know, just a few moments ago, somebody came to me and told me, you were here by mistake. <laughs> because humanly speaking, all those that will make it there, from some other people's perspective, can be interpreted as a mistake. Because divine grace, from a human perspective, can be misinterpreted as a mistake. Or you will be looking for somebody and you can find that person there. Where is mom? Where is my child? Where is Pastor Joe? Oh, here. <laughs> so what I'm trying to point out is that this is the greatest thing that God can do to us. Because we are not taught in the Bible that when we are going to heaven, we'll be brainwashed. 
that's not God's way of fixing us. God's way of fixing us is called therapy. And don't forget that the final destruction of the wicked will be here when fire comes down from heaven, which is actually after the thousand years. So you may have some questions throughout the thousand years that need answer. And right after the thousand years when the destruction of the evil happens, and if you look at this timeline, it becomes obvious why in the book of Revelation, the moment when God will wipe away every tear is where? You tell me, where is that moment? Is it here before the thousand years? No. Is it during the thousand years? No. Where is it? Here. Why? Because throughout this section here, throughout the thousand year, healing or therapy is happening. So practically, this is how I read this section of the book of Revelation. You know what a city break is? City break? It's when you go from one place and spend like a weekend in a city, enjoy your life, and come back. Okay, that's a city break. So this is how I imagine this. After so much trouble, because... The final stage of Earth's history will be troublesome. Trouble, trouble, trouble. You will need a city break where you will be treated by the best therapist in the world. So Jesus Christ himself will take you to the city, the city of Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, do the therapy for you. It will take some time. The Bible calls it a thousand years. And then at the end of the city break, the city break does not end actually because the city comes down and becomes the capital city of the new earth. That's the story. And there shall be no more curse. Where was the first curse? When they left Eden. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants, that is, you, that's us, shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. He who overcomes, I will give him or grant him to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Here we are. So what is the new Jerusalem all about? Well, it's the bride of the Lamb. More precisely, those inside new Jerusalem are the bride of the Lamb. Is the opposite of Babylon. Babylon is the city of confusion. Jerusalem is the city of Shalom, Jerusalem, Shalom. It's paradise found. It takes you back to the Garden of Eden. It's the Holy of Holies, the residence of God. And it's the ideal Jerusalem, meaning the new Jerusalem is everything that the earthly Jerusalem never got to be, really. Perfection. Perfection. The perfect state of shalom, of peace. And then the story goes on with a, an epilogue, because the book also has a prologue, an epilogue. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God, 
and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Please notice that contrary to the book of Daniel that was sealed, or at least part of it, this book was never sealed. So this was to be understood from that time on. He who is unjust, let be unjust still. He who is filthy, let be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I, Jesus, have sent my angel. Oh, this is Jesus speaking. It's like dictating to John what to write. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. I think this is a very interesting picture because how can somebody be the root and the offspring of somebody? Well, Jesus can because he's both before David and after David. The bright and morning star is the star that brings in the morning. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. This is why I said earlier that the water of life is already available. Right? He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. And then it ends with the words, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I skipped a few verses just to make it shorter. But I want to remind you that in that last chapter, if I'm not wrong, verse 18, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in the book. There's a reason why I'm emphasizing this. The book of Revelation is probably the most misinterpreted book of the Bible. Why? Because many people feel at liberty to say all kind of things, do all kind of interpretations, and uh, put their own thoughts into the book of Revelation, and then read it out from there. The main reason why I'm trying to be as careful as possible when interpreting the book, and in some places when I'm not sure I would rather leave it like that is because I feel responsibility. There are things that are very clear. There are things that are somewhat obscure, difficult to interpret. I don't believe it is my role to clarify what God made complicated. My role is to make you think, to challenge your thought process, and uh, stir your desire to go even deeper. My desire with the seven steps or seven week journey was to give an overall picture of what the book of Revelation is. And this is what it is. 
I think by this time, you should be able to understand the structure, and you should know that up here in this circle is who? The lamb with the 144,000 celebrating victory. If that's not a message of encouragement, then what is it? Very good question. So the question is, are we saying that throughout the thousand years, the tears will not be wiped away yet, and um, we will have to deal with all sorts of painful experiences, like not finding there somebody that we wish would be there, and uh, does this mean that we will spend a thousand years in pain? I think the answer to that is no, meaning when you are doing therapy, little by little, you get healing. And you are being uh, treated here by the best therapist in the universe, Jesus Christ. So I'm not saying there is no tear wiping throughout the thousand years. Every session, every therapy session is a session of wiping away tears. But what the text says is that all tears, and I emphasize all, all tears will be wiped away here at the end, at the end of all this. Okay? After, after the wicked will be resurrected and destroyed. Because I suspect even that event will be a somewhat complicated event. Even if throughout the thousand years we will be somewhat prepared for that to happen. But if the Bible calls the execution of final divine judgment a strange work of God, then I can imagine it will be a strange work for us as well. Right? But I don't think God will keep us in pain like for a thousand years and will never deal with our pain until the thousand year pass and then he will start wiping away tears. No, I think throughout the healing process or the therapy that will take place. But the text brings it to our attention that at the end of it all, all tears will be wiped away, meaning that from that moment on, what is of the past is of the past. We are healed. From that moment on, we, through the therapy that God provided, that the healer provided, the therapist provided, we will be healed. And that will be the final moment of wiping away everything. Let me, let me repeat briefly what I got from your observation. I think it is correct to say that healing or therapy also comes by God eliminating or removing those factors that cause the pain, the tears that we experience. So on one hand, he removes the cause. On the other hand, he heals us, meaning that our attitude toward what we remember will be shaped in a way that whatever happened in the past, from that point on, will not be remembered. What happened, what was of the past, is of the past. And this is not brainwashing, I'm emphasizing that, it is therapy, which is two different realities. Thank you. So the question is, if the book of Revelation was never sealed, meaning it was meant to be understood from the very get-go, which is the first century, the last decade, in the 90s, roughly. Then what can we say about the book of Daniel? Is there a moment in time where the book of Daniel, or at least the section of the book of Daniel that was sealed 
was unsealed, was opened, yes. And that moment is indicated in the book of uh, Revelation, in Revelation chapter 10. Let me draw the timeline in the seven segments. Okay, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Let me make this longer. Seventh, okay? There is a moment here in the seventh trumpet, in the sixth trumpet. So there is a moment, there is a moment in the sixth trumpet, which is here, Revelation 10, when an angel appears with an open book, a booklet, a little book, a small book, a scroll. But when John takes the book from the angel, the book is open already. So it means if the angel appears here somewhere, then the opening of the book, because when he appears, when the angel appears to John, and John takes the book and eats it, and uh, it's sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach, it means that the opening happens earlier. So somewhere here. And then when he eats the book, and it's, sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach, that's when he receives the divine command, you shall prophesy again. And that's why we are saying, and we have historically been saying, that the Seventh-day Adventist movement, the Advent movement, started with this open book the little book, the little scroll, because it was discovering the prophecies from the book of Daniel, the 1260 days prophecy and the 2300 evening morning prophecy. And that's where at one point the text says, and there will be no more time. No more chronos. All of that is in chapter 10 in the book of Revelation. So somewhere here the book is open. And John playing out the role of those that read the book and start understanding the content of the book that used to be sealed before. He, received that, uh, he receives that um, command, now go and prophesy again. And that's when, practically, the three angels start flying. Good question. So, we have this Bible passage in John chapter 1, 29. Yes. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Does this refer to what is happening during the thousand years, meaning here? I believe no. Let me explain why. I believe this passage, which, which speaks about taking away the sin of the world, it's a singular sin of the world. So it's a collective concept of sin, the sin, the whole sin of the world, is what Jesus does at the cross. So, in principle, at the cross, Jesus takes away the sin, the general or the overall sin of the world. 
in principle. Why in principle? Because in practical terms, he cannot take away what humans won't give to him. Because taking away somebody's sin means that you give up your sinfulness, he takes it away, and he dies for it. That's the concept of sin. Sin is something that kills, that destroys. So if your sin is taken away, and not destroy in the sense of you're going to die, but in the sense of second death, a death from which there is no resurrection. The same concept of death that we find in the book of Revelation in uh, this section. The wicked, when they are resurrected and destroyed, that is a second death, that is a death from which there is no way back, no return. So practically sin, the concept of sin biblically, is something that destroys if you give your sin to Jesus Christ, because of the cross, where in principle or in legal terms, he took away the sins of the world, then it's on him. The problem with the rest of the sin of the world is that it was never given to Jesus Christ. Therefore, those that do it, meaning Satan, his angels, and human beings that don't give up their sinfulness, that do not accept the change, Jesus, to take on their sins and die for their sins, they will be destroyed by their sins. But before being destroyed by their own sins, there is a time of clarification in front of the whole universe so by the time they will carry the final consequence of their sinfulness, which is second death, a death, a death from which there is no return, in front of the whole universe, it is clarified why these people will be annihilated, taken out, axed out for good. So back to the text, the text speaks about the cross. The text cannot include those that don't give, don't give up their sinfulness so that Jesus can take them. In the way the Old Testament sanctuary played that whole story out was this. When somebody sinned, you would go to the sanctuary with a sacrifice, with a, an animal symbolizing Jesus Christ, put your hands on the head of the sacrifice, placing your sins, thereby transferring your sins on the sacrifice. The sacrifice animal would be sacrificed and through the blood of the sacrifice animal, your sin will pu was put in a, in a storage kind of thing in the Holy of Holies. Your sin was forgiven. You left free of your sin. But your sin was not de dealt with to the end. It was just placed in storage in the Holy of Holies. Then, one day of the year, on the day of uh, Yom Kippur, and that's why the text emphasizes, the book of Revelation emphasizes Yom Kippur. From this point on, it's Yom Kippur. On the day of Yom Kippur, or the day of atonement, the priest would uh, go into the storage of sins, take all the sins that are there, bring them out, and put them on the head of uh, the goat of Azazel. If you heard about 
Azazel. Now, Azazel was the goat that was going to carry the unforgiven sins out to the wilderness and then die in the wilderness, which is practically pretty much the same thing that after the wilderness experience here, Satan is destroyed and those that assimilated with him are also destroyed. So that's the story of handling sin in biblical terms. The last section here is about the festival of Sukkot or the tabernacles. Is that the time where Jesus' words are completed or fulfilled when he said at the Last Supper that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I will drink it with you anew in my kingdom? And the answer is yes. And let me give you some more insight on that from the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, you remember that at this section here, which is the final section, right? Or on this graph here, the final section, Jesus is knocking at the door. Well, the easiest way of interpreting that text and I'm sure you heard sermons on that, is that Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Nevertheless, the text says much more than that. Because in Matthew 24, you can read a parable or a, an illustration given by Jesus Christ when he says, when you see the fig tree giving leaves, you know summer is near. You remember that illustration? Now, when you are going to see these things happening, meaning the signs of His coming, you will know that He is close. He is at the door. So when Jesus is knocking at the door here, the text is not speaking merely about him knocking at the heart of uh, humans. He's knocking, so to speak, at the door of history. And what he wants is to come in and have supper. Right? And then in chapter 19, which is this section here, we are told about the supper of the marriage of the Lamb, right? So practically, those that open the door for Him to come in are taken to the supper of the marriage of the Lamb. And that's where the Lord's Supper is reiterated. That's when Jesus drinks anew the fruit of the vine with you in my kingdom. Good question. So if you read this passage, Revelation 22, verse 2, from this particular translation, which is the NKJ, New King James Version, you're somewhat confused because it says, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river. So you have the river and on either side of the river, so one side and the other side, was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. So once you have one tree and then you have two trees, in all honesty, the text is difficult. And if you will read different versions, you will see slight variations on the translation. But the way I try to capture it is this. It seems that the river 
goes or flows in between the two, how do you call that, the trunks of, uh, of the tree. So it's a tree that has two parts coming out and is somehow arching together above the river. That's the best picture I can paint about it. So then it's one, but it's two, because it's one side and the other side. But again, the text is difficult. So it's uh, probably fair to say, I don't know exactly. But it's one and it's two in the same text at the same time. Yeah, good question, interesting question. So the text is pretty complex in the sense that you have to put them together like a puzzle so that you can see the chronology. But this is roughly the picture. The New Jerusalem comes down. The wicked resurrected, rounded up by Satan himself, are ready to attack New Jerusalem. And that's when fire comes down and devours them. So your question is, okay, so those in the city will be able to see what is happening outside? I don't know. What I know is that the walls of the city are huge. I don't see windows on the walls. I see gates on the walls. Now, the gates are open. Will those in the city be curious and gather at the gates like that to see what is happening out there? I'm kind of reluctant to that idea. Because that's a weird scenery to see. But again, the text does not deal with that. So I will not go into too much speculation here. That's a very good question. So the question is, when New Jerusalem comes down, will the New Jerusalem touch the earth? The text again does not indicate that. The text says that the New Jerusalem was coming down. How much low, how much down, I don't know. But if it's not close enough, how are they going to attack? Because the wicked are attacking the city. So it has to be fairly low. Does it touch or not? It's not, it's not specified here. There's another prophecy that some people bring in here from the book of Zechariah, where the mountain of um, olives cracks and uh, the new Jerusalem, the city, comes down there. But that's not a picture from here. The question that comes or flows naturally from your question is this. So if the new Jerusalem comes down, touches ground, and then fire comes down, and then the, the earth is recreated, how come fire does not affect the city. But then the question can be, how come fire did not affect the burning bush? So it's not a real problem. Good question. So since the wicked is already brought to silence or killed in the language of the book of Revelation chapter 19, by the sword of his mouth. So they are not alive. What is the point then bringing them back to life and then destroying them? It is, it is a very good question because at first glance or at, at a superficial look, it may seem like it's so useless, so senseless. Forget about them. They are dead anyways. Why bother about them? 
But it seems to me that there is something in the big scheme of works, in the way God handles justly or righteously the problem of sin and sinfulness, that asks for one more demonstration. And to my mind, the fact that the gates of the city are open is like a final demonstration in front of the whole universe that even if I leave the doors open, the gates open, they will not enter. They are so wicked, so corrupt, so bent on evil that they don't care about salvation. All they care about is destruction. So here, when the first resurrection happens and the wicked are destroyed, we are speaking about the wicked that are alive at that time. But the final judgment after the thousand years deals with all the wicked from all centuries. So it seems that in the big scheme of works, God does a final demonstration when he allows the whole power, the whole array of wickedness from the whole history of uh, humanity to gather together round it up, show us what they are capable of, and it's a final demonstration of, of divine power of annihilating, bringing it to an end. But one thing I know for sure from the book of Revelation, that justice and righteousness, God's justice and righteousness is always in view. The picture I see is this. Throughout the centuries, God allows for his righteousness, for his justice to be questioned. Questioned even by his own. Because let's assume it. We sometimes question God's righteousness and justice. And God knows that. And it's like God says, yeah, I, I, I would take this. I prefer taking this and then clarify everything at the end. Because God's actions throughout history, as long as His justice is mixed with mercy, that kind of divine action will always be susceptible of uh, some sort of injustice. Because when God is merciful to somebody that hurt me, I will suspect God is unjust toward me. So God is misjudged, misinterpreted throughout history. But then there is a final moment right at the end where everything is clarified with this final demonstration of all wickedness together trying to attack and destroy God's city. And that's when God says, what is enough is enough. So throughout the history of uh, the book of Revelation, I can see this light motive of divine justice being questioned that at one point um, those under the altar cry out and say, how long? Right? So they're asking for justice. And God tarries a little longer. Okay? But then everything has to be clarified. And throughout the Bible, God's righteousness, His justice, is an important element of the plan of salvation. We usually focus on the salvation part of the plan of salvation. But the plan of salvation also includes this divine demonstration of righteousness and justice. And that's the final point of the book of Revelation. And from that on, shalom is perfect. And shalom means perfect righteousness. Where people cannot hurt, will not hurt one another. Where there will be no pain, no death, nothing that reminds of uh, the sinful experience 
of this earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the beauty of the gospel. When we look at the book of Revelation, we see a masterpiece of Revelation. Yes, some parts are challenging, hard to understand, or hard to get, hard to accept. But Lord, we trust you, we rely on your wisdom, and we know that that time of therapy will indeed bring healing, will reestablish peace within, and then peace without will also be established by your new creation. Lord, we pray that each one of us will take these prophecies seriously, will see how we can implement their teachings in our lives, and wherever we have the possibility to open somebody's eyes, we will do that, led by the Holy Spirit. May Jesus Christ be victorious in our lives, because in his name we prayed.